everyone and welcome. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the meeting. Um, we're going to give it just another minute for a few more folks to join. And then we will start our event this evening. Thank you for your patience. We're glad you all could join us tonight. Gracias por su paciencia. Vamos a comenzar en un minuto. Estamos esperando a que otras personas entren a la junta y comenzaremos. Okay, why don't we get going since you all have uh, joined right on time. Um, thank you very much everyone for joining this evening. Um, tonight is the second meeting in our educational forum series. Tonight's topic is going to be on economic development and our speaker tonight is going to be Doug Svensson from ADE who's the economist on our team. Um, before we move on, Doug, can you share your screen? And then we have um, simultaneous interpretation into Spanish. And I'd like to turn it over to our Spanish interpreters, Maria and Ana, to um, give an introduction. Buenas tardes. Um, gracias por estar aquí. Hoy es la segunda junta que tenemos. El tema de hoy es el desarrollo económico y el presentador va a ser Doug Svensson de ADE. ADE. Um, tenemos interpretación simultánea para esta reunión y se dará en español. Seleccione en la barra inferior a, en el lado derecho el botón donde hay un pequeño mundo que dice interpretación. Seleccione español en su barra de herramientas para proceder al idioma deseado. Okay. Thank you, Maria. Um, Everyone, um, if Aram, if you want to, um, Doug, if you want to stop sharing for a minute, and then Aram, if you could start the um, interpretation, um, that would be great. Um, so if everyone can see on the bottom of the screen, um, there should be a button called interpretation, and everyone should click on that and either pick English or Spanish, depending on which room you want to be in. Um, if, you, if you don't pick either, you're going to miss some of the conversation. So if everyone can just take a minute and um, pick English or Spanish, that would be great. And you should have at the bottom either English or Spanish as your language. Okay, um, Doug, let's go back to sharing the screen again. And um, we're going to start um, the official program now. Okay, um, again, tonight's meeting is about economic development, um, but this is all couched in our general plan update, as I'm sure you all know. Um, as a reminder, the general plan update um, and the general plan is a long-term policy document for the city that establishes the city's vision for the next 25 to 30 years. It identifies strengths, topics of concern, and allows all of you to come together to help develop a shared vision for the future of the city. Um, the general plans are typically um, updated about every 10 to 15 years. Your last general plan was updated in 2005. So the city of Ventura is right on target for updating this general plan. And the general plan is updated according to guidelines um, and regulations um, by the office, by the state, by the Office of Planning and Research. Next slide. Um, Doug, next slide, please. Yes, it's, it, there's a little bit of a lag. Got it. Okay. Um, apologies, everyone. Um, not sure why there is a lag time here, um, but the, um, 
the process that we are on is about a two year process to update the general plan. Um, we are right now in, um, in the discovery phase of the project and will then be moving into the visioning phase. Following visioning, there'll be the alternatives phase um, and then plan development followed by review and adoption. Um, we're talking about economic development um, this evening because we, um, we realize that economic development is one of the most critical topics for making the city go because it has to do with the revenues, the city, the revenues from the city. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Doug now, who's going to handle the remainder of the presentation. Uh, and he's going to talk about, um, give some background information on economic development in the city, um, lots of data and information. And then we're going to turn it over um, for a question and answer session, um, a question and answer and comments as well. So again, the purpose of these educational forums is um, to provide you all with information and background information, but also to allow all of you to ask questions to help us with our thinking about the project. Okay, Doug, take it away, please. Thank you very much, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. On this screen, it uh, shows the different topics that I'd like to go through with you this evening before we get to the discussion. So we'll, <clears throat> Matt has already talked about the general plan background. So I'm gonna start with um, what are the different components of the city economy that create jobs. And then we're gonna talk a bit about retail in the city and the relationship between economic development and the city's budget and fiscal health. And then finally, we wanna get into looking at the future and what are some of the trends that we think the city of Ventura will be seeing and how can that affect um, the general plan going forward. There are a number of reasons why we wanna look at economic development and the city has uh, determined that the general plan will include an economic development element. One of the main things is that it helps increase the city's resiliency. And we've all been through a very tough year and it's still continuing. And the more diversity that we have in the economy, the easier it is for us to weather not only this kind of pandemic, but also other recessions and economic downturns that occur. And it gives us the opportunity to focus on job growth in future oriented businesses, um, which is a way to help create high paying jobs for local residents. And really importantly, to create career opportunities for young people. So as they grow up in Ventura and go away to college, they have careers and jobs to come back to here in the city. Ventura has a number of educational institutions, not only Ventura College, but other universities in the region. And uh, looking at economic development helps us coordinate you know, the kinds of education and workforce training programs that are available that benefit not only workers, but the business community. As you'll see, um, economic development helps to enhance the quality of life by creating better commercial and entertainment opportunities, and also supports the city's fiscal health and funding for municipal services, which includes police and fire, streets and sidewalks, parks and recreation, all the services that you all um, expect from the city. And this graph kind of reinforces that relationship. So the general plan is addressing uh, land uses there on the left side in the gray uh, boxes, the residential population and housing, uh, jobs and non-residential development, and also visitors in the tourism economy. And each of those land uses create uh, revenues, uh, tax revenues in particular that go to the city's general fund. So retail sales tax, the property tax, which you all pay as, as property owners and visitors in particular generate the transient occupancy tax or bed tax. And if you look at the percentages for each of these that, uh, of the general fund and add those up, it's more than half. So more than half of the general fund is um, supported by these kind of revenues. And those revenues go directly to uh, supporting public facilities and services, which is a a major component of the quality of life in residential neighborhoods. 
some of the trends that we've been seeing that I want to share with you this evening, um, both the city and Ventura County are lagging behind state economic trends. So while there's been some job growth uh, since the last recession before the pandemic, it's not nearly as strong as what we're seeing in elsewhere in California. The city does have some opportunities with innovative industry clusters, but we're finding that the need to provide housing for the workforce is a major concern in stimulating growth in some of these sectors. Uh, retail sector has been very strong for Ventura over the years prior to the pandemic, but now we're facing a number of challenges as you all can imagine. Um, and some of these are trends that have been continuing for a number of years. Tourism is an important contribution to city revenues, uh, but also uh, retail, industrial and office businesses all have contributions to make to the city revenues. One thing we're seeing is that older housing uh, with lower assessed values really uh, no longer generate the sufficient tax revenue to support services. And this has uh, contributed to what the city is calling a structural deficit in its budget where um, costs are higher than revenues. But as we look to the future and consider options in the general plan, newer higher density housing creates a more positive fiscal balance. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. <clears throat> so looking at the jobs that are in the city, um, this graph shows uh, the number of jobs by the different types of businesses and industries that we have. So at the top of the chart, for example, healthcare, uh, retail trade and accommodation and food service, which are largely the tourism economy, are the three largest uh, business types that create jobs in Ventura. And the green bars that you see on, on the graph are the growth between 2010, which was kind of the, the bottom of the last recession up through March of 2020. So really before the pandemic hit, and you can see there that healthcare was a leading job growth sector, um, but also tourism did well. Uh, construction was doing well, management of companies, which is sort of corporate offices. Uh, overall, the city has slightly more jobs than it has labor force living in the city. Um, and it has a jobs housing ratio of 1.4, which is generally considered pretty good. But as I mentioned, over the last 10 years, the city and the county have both had less than 1% per year uh, growth in jobs, while the state has been at 1.9%, so more than double. Some of the industry clusters that are important for the city, uh, I mentioned healthcare already. Um, in addition to actual um, health services, the city also has some medical device manufacturing, which is an important manufacturing sector. Um, but the pandemic has created a lot of issues, obviously, for, for healthcare. And so that's something that we need to be concerned about in the future. Business services is another area um, that's seen a lot of growth, I mentioned before, in corporate management offices but also businesses like computer systems design. Now, as many of us know, uh, office workers have been working remotely, many businesses have, and that you know, may continue into the future. And so that's gonna affect the office market. Tourism and hospitality has probably been hit the hardest in the pandemic. Um, and it obviously is gonna need to uh, compete better with other regional destinations by creating more attractions and, and lodging opportunities in order to recover. Some of the more tech-oriented clusters that the city has, uh, advertising and marketing technology, um, companies such as Trade Desk and GiddyUp uh, have come into Ventura and had some pretty good growth in recent years. But as I mentioned earlier, one of the real challenges is finding housing for the workforce that um, would be um, employed in these kind of businesses. Same thing in manufacturing. Um, many of you may have heard of 3D uh, printing. It's uh, an important uh, advanced manufacturing technique that's gaining uh, a lot of traction. Um, there are companies in Ventura that are working in that area, but again, they'll need uh, modern industrial facilities and space 
and increasing talent pool in order to continue to grow, which gets back again to the housing. City has some other opportunities such as um, aquaculture out in the harbor. So um, cultivating mussels, for example, or other uh, fish maybe um, to add to the um, to agriculture and food supply. And also we've been seeing a lot of growth in design services, which, which contributes to a lot of these other um, clusters and creates high paying uh, creative type jobs. So some of the concerns I've mentioned as I've gone along, housing is extremely important to not only attract, but retain workers. And we need all types of housing, not only uh, entry level millennials, but also executive housing in order to really support growth in some of these technology sectors. As we go through the general plan, we'll be looking for uh, locations for uh, office and industrial development that can create the amenities that are needed, particularly uh, broadband connections, as well as broadband throughout the neighborhood as workers continue to work remotely. At the same time, we'll be looking for opportunities to upgrade existing commercial buildings, um, uh, maybe create mixed use opportunities. A lot of companies are combining operations where they'll have manufacturing, distribution, retail, all in the same building in different areas along with research and development. And so new models for using buildings are gonna be increasingly important in the future. I mentioned before, we wanna coordinate closely with educational institutions to make sure that workers have access to the skills that they need. And in the tourist economy, um, we need to look at ways to create more visitor attractions and, and additional types of lodging to support that industry. So now I'll shift gears a bit and talk about retail, which is something that I think everyone is vitally interested in. Um, up until the pandemic, so the, through the end of 2019, the city of Ventura actually had the highest per capita retail sales of any of the cities um, in Ventura County. So that's really positive, particularly for sales tax that that, that generates. Uh, we estimate that the purchasing power in Ventura is uh, over $1.2 billion. Uh, about 75% of that is household spending. So people living in Ventura, but about 20% of that actually comes from visitors in the tourist economy. And then another 5% is business to business sales and commuters that come in to work and spend money while they're here. Actual sales in Ventura exceed that purchasing power by over $800 million a year. So that's kind of the excess uh, additional uh, retail success that the city has had over some of the other cities in the county. There are some uh, Store types like apparel and home furnishings where Ventura doesn't do as well, but overall um, we see a lot of positive trends there. Uh, the automotive sector is the leading sales tax generator with almost a quarter of all the sales tax that uh, the city sees, but also eating and drinking places contribute almost 20%. So there again, that's the benefit of the tourist economy as well as local residents. General merchandise includes the, the mall and, and those kinds of um, uh, larger format stores. They're about a little over 10% of the total. So as we're all aware, retail has been undergoing a lot of changes over a number of years. Um, and that's all accelerated this last year with the pandemic. This chart so shows the percent of retail sales that occur on the internet and goes all the way back to the year 2000. And you can see a really steady progression all the way up through 2019. But then in 2020, it just was off the charts. So we expected it to continue to grow, but it grew seven or eight years uh, in just one year because people couldn't get out to stores to shop. Now we expect that to um, resume back to the trend that it was on to a degree, but we think possibly, you know, it's gonna, be growing from a higher base point because people are, are used to shopping online and that's gonna continue at a higher rate. So what happens there is a lot of retailers are reducing the number of their stores. They're making smaller stores. So when they put in new stores, they're making them smaller and expecting that more of their sales 
are going to occur online and less in their um, storefronts. Um, some of the larger retail buildings are actually being converted to distribution so that when you buy something online, it can be got to your doorstep uh, more quickly. It's called last mile delivery um, from distribution centers that are closer to town. Some of the older strip commercial centers are now being occupied by services uh, or lower end retail. And overall retail has been moving toward trying to provide more entertainment, more of an experience, um, not so much about goods and services. And so there's a real need to constantly renovate and upgrade um, retail stores, retail shopping centers to attract consumers. So all of this relates to how the city um, gets revenue and supports municipal services. Um, the general fund, as I mentioned earlier, is supported mostly by general tax revenues, property tax, sales tax, and a few others. Um, police and fire, so public safety, are the largest service expenditures that the city makes. Uh, but it also supports other government functions, parks and recreation, as I mentioned, street maintenance, and so forth. Um, over the last couple years, the city has identified that its costs are higher than its revenues and it's making adjustments in, in how it provides services. But of course, the pandemic has made all of that much worse by reducing uh, a lot of the sales tax that the city normally gets and other revenues from tourism. So for the land, for the general plan, we've looked at how land uses affect uh, city revenues and costs to, so that as we develop a new land use plan and look at future development, we can understand how that might affect city services. In this chart, we've um, calculated on a per acre basis how each land use generates revenues and how much it costs to provide services. And you can see on the right hand side of the chart, the um, uh, tourism development, uh, commercial, office, industrial, all have positive net revenue over costs on a per acre basis. But on the left-hand side of the chart, the existing single family units actually create a deficit. I'm gonna go into that a little bit more um, in a moment, but you know, other single family that's valued a little higher or high density multifamily also does create a positive net revenue. So as we're looking at future housing opportunities for Ventura, it's important to keep these sorts of things in mind. And just to get into that in a little more detail, um, we've estimated that currently the average assessed value for single family homes in Ventura <clears throat> is a little over 342,000. And I think most of you will recognize that that's pretty well below market rate. You couldn't really buy a house at that level, but that's the assessed value because many of the homes have been occupied by families for many years and they haven't been assessed up to market value. So in the chart on the left-hand side, you can see the single family there at 342,000, the green bar are the revenues that are generated. So a little over $10,000, but the yellow bar is the cost uh, to provide services, which is you know, closer to 11 or 12,000. So that creates a deficit there. Same thing with multifamily, the existing lower density multifamily that the city has currently, the average assessed value is only about 235,000. So if we wanna see what would it take to balance this fiscal uh, equation, single family homes at about 445,000 uh, assessed value kind of break even. They generate enough property tax to pay for what we think the services cost. So that's kind of what we're looking at in terms of an average value. But we've also looked at um, the city doesn't have a lot of places to build new single family units. The land is scarce. So we've also looked at multifamily units. Um, in this case, at 30 units per acre, where we could have a mixture of of higher income households and moderate income households and, and lower income households living um, in proximity. And, and through that process, we get an average assessed value that's actually higher. It's up to 542,000. And that actually generates pretty healthy surplus for the city. So 
as we're going through the general plan update and looking at housing opportunities and options, um, the city will be able to create a lot more housing um, for multifamily at these kind of densities. And at the same time, it, it uh, is more likely to be able to pay for the services that those residents will need. So what are some of the trends that we're looking at that are gonna affect the city going forward? Um, I mentioned before, healthcare is the largest job sector, but there are a lot of reasons to think that job growth is gonna slow down. They're, they've had some financial issues out of the pandemic. The demographics eventually are gonna change as baby boomers get older. And so there's a good chance that the city's not gonna be able to rely on healthcare as a job engine as it has in the past. On the other hand, there are other opportunities for manufacturing as the US tries to increase its resiliency for pharmaceuticals, they're looking at bringing more of that manufacturing to the US uh, from overseas. Um, manufacturing is accelerating in terms of automation, increased demand for 3D printing and robotics, as I mentioned earlier. Some of this has been accelerated by the pandemic because you know, we're, we're having fewer workers, more machine operated uh, operations. Um, and there are companies in the Ventura area and in Ventura County in general that are working in these areas. So these are actually real opportunities for jobs in, in manufacturing. At the same time, as we talked about, e-commerce is expanding the need for more warehouse space. Um, that's creating some issues for other industries that need that space. Um, so we're gonna need to look for um, land areas that can support industrial development generally. Um, and then as far as the office market, uh, from a real estate standpoint, um, the shift to remote working you know, could affect as many as 20% of the workforce going forward may, may work at home three days a week. Um, that's probably going to reduce the demand for, for future office to a degree. One of the things I mentioned early on that we want to try to do with economic development is match job opportunities to our local existing workforce and the, and the workforce of the future as our young people grow up. So this chart compares the jobs that are in Ventura and, and then the workers that live in Ventura that work in these kinds of industries. So just at the top there, healthcare and social, social assistance. The dark bar is the number of jobs that are physically located in the city of Ventura. And the red bar there are the number of workers that are employed in healthcare and social assistance that actually live in Ventura. So from that, you can see that there are basically twice as many healthcare jobs in the city as there are healthcare workers. And so those additional jobs are, are being uh, occupied by people who commute in to Ventura. Um, and so we have other surpluses there. For example, uh, the, there are more government jobs and there are uh, government workers living in the city. That's true for tourism, construction, uh, some of the corporate uh, headquarters type uh, jobs as well. But then on the flip side of that, there are a number of uh, business types where we have more workers living in Ventura than we have those kind of jobs. So that would be in education, professional services, manufacturing, finance, and information technology. So we thought we would wanna maybe focus in on those sectors to see what would be involved with bringing more jobs of that type so that local people could be employed locally. So these sectors are here. The first column shows the actual deficit in the number of um, jobs locally that would fully employ the Ventura workforce. And then we've looked at what would be the annual wages for those types of jobs. So at the top of the scale is the finance, uh, uh, finance and insurance sector at almost $100,000 on average per job. Then you get into um, professional and scientific and technical services, which is a lot of the tech sector. Um, that's you know just over eighty-two thousand, and on down. And it's important, as I mentioned, that we have housing opportunities to support the job growth. So we've included here what we think the affordable median house, either to buy or to rent. So these two columns show those two different things. Um, based on what the household income would be at, for workers at these wage levels. 
And at the very uh, bottom of the um, table, you can see that the current um, average home value is um, almost $730,000. So again, we were talking earlier about assessed value down around 300,000 and a break even point of 400,000, but new, new sales are occurring at a much higher level, almost 700,000. So really only um, the upper 50% of the finance and insurance workers could afford to buy a house at these levels uh, if these rates remain current. Um, and the kind of top four sectors can all afford uh, typical rents, which uh, we understand are just below $2,000 a month. So this kind of reinforces again that, you know, we want to create jobs for the workers that live here, but at the same time, we need to create housing opportunities that are affordable for those workers in order to really be successful going forward. So just to wrap up, um, <clears throat> we're looking for growing businesses that have a future for the city and a future for the workforce in the city. And, and in many of those respects, they um, do enhance the quality of life and, and improve the fiscal health of the city through creating more vibrant retail centers, uh, entertainment, but also manufacturing and office uses that, that create additional property tax base to offset the residential. We have opportunities to create a lot of new, interesting, creative jobs that are well-paying, but we need the housing stock to support that. And that's probably going to occur through higher density housing, which not only creates more housing, but it's more affordable and creates a more positive fiscal balance. Um, we can expect a lot of changes in retail throughout the city as the years go on. Um, so that's something that's going to be an important topic for the general plan to address through land use um, and zoning uh, criteria. And also ways to improve um, the tourism economy would have an enormous benefit um, on the economics for the city and, and providing services. So these are some of the questions that we'd like to get your input on this evening, as well as questions you might have on the information that I've provided so far. But we're really interested in hearing from you on what you think the long-term economic goals of the city should be as we, as we pursue the general plan update. And what land use changes do you think would help improve the city's economic outlook and what areas of the city um, really could be improved to uh, create more economic development opportunities, whether those might be retail commercial areas or the industrial areas or some of the other areas where jobs are created. So at this point, I'm gonna conclude the presentation and look forward to your questions and your comments and your input on, on some of these questions that are important as we move forward. So Matt, I'm gonna turn back to you and you're gonna recognize people who have questions or comments and I will do the best I can to answer your questions as we go along. Okay, thank you, Doug. Um, that was um, a lot of information um, and um, very good background on the relationship between economic development and other goals of the city. So thank you for doing that. Um, I'd like to, um, what, what we'd like to do for the rest of our time, and, and I think we have um, until 7.30 or even 8 o'clock, um, is first start with some questions. And I'd like to ask everyone to use the raise hand feature. Um, it, is, uh, it could be any number of places in Zoom. We were working on this before the meeting today, which is that um, Zoom uh, is different for everybody. And so sometimes it's in the reactions um, that you can raise your hand. Sometimes it is in the participants um, participant list where you can raise your hand. If you, for some reason, cannot um, find it any of those places, if you could put in the chat that you have a question, then um, please do that and we will recognize you um, from the chat. Um, please just write in there that you have a question, not necessarily what your question is. Um, we'd like to have each person ask. Um, so why don't we go ahead and just, I did see some some comments and questions in the chat. Um, if you want to repeat those to everyone and ask Doug the question, um, please go ahead and, and add your hand to the raise hand feature. Um, and then I'm just going to go down the list um, in order and, um, and call on folks. 
Um, so when I do, please unmute yourself if you, um, if you can or you would like. If you can take off your, um, uh, if you can um, show your face, then we would certainly appreciate that. Um, and we're also going to be looking um, to the, the uh, Spanish interpretation room to see if anyone has questions there. Um, so why don't we start with the first person who had their hand up, um, Todd Collert. Did I pronounce yes, your uh, last name right? I apologize. Correct. Yes, please. thank you. Uh, Doug accumulated 50, roughly 50% of the revenue stream that goes to support the general plan between retail, sales taxes, property taxes, and transit, transit occupancy taxes. So where does the remaining 50% come from? What other revenue streams does the city have? And aren't there ways of discussing those? Shouldn't those be on the agenda? Yes, so the um, other revenues the city has, um, for example, uh, utility users tax. Um, the city also um, charges fees directly for certain services. And, and, and probably the most obvious examples would be water and sewer um, services. So, so households pay directly um, those monthly charges. Um, there are a few uh, state related um, subventions that the city gets, for example, gas taxes to help with street maintenance and things like that. So there are a variety of revenue sources. When we do this analysis, like showing how each land use contributes to the city's budget, we include all the revenues. So um, what I was focusing on um, there in terms of the general fund, um, are some of the key ones that um, economic development directly contributes to, but as you say, you know, just less than 50% are these other revenues that um, uh, households and businesses also pay. But those are restricted funds. So if you've got parks, you've got police, police being the and fire being the largest budget items, those restricted funds for subventions, for gas, uh, for user fees, can only be used for water, for sanitation, things like that. So it still seems like we need general unrestricted funds, which only the ones I thought you identify were maybe utility tax and the other three you mentioned previously. So it still that's, seems like we're coming up short. That's a very good point. And, and that's part of the reason for showing those is that they are sort of general unrestricted tax revenues. Um, the city needs those revenues to pay for a lot of the services that don't have direct funding sources. Um, so that's um, extremely important. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Todd, Doug. Thanks for that um, explanation. Um, next is um, Pete Freeman. Yeah, I was wondering if um, transportation costs or issues have been looked at in association with um, bringing businesses here. I've spoken to people at Procter & Gamble over in Oxnard that make Charmin toilet paper. And I was told that that plant wouldn't be there if it just made the toilet paper, but because of excess steam from the production process, they can make and sell electricity. So, and the reason it wouldn't have been there um, is because of transportation. That is something that we're we're looking at. Um, there's there were, in addition to the economic development element in the general plan, there'll also be a circulation element that will specifically look at um, traffic and, and transit options. Um, so we do look at the city in terms of what its its key location criteria are for different businesses. Um, transportation is a really important one. Um, in the interviews that we've done with businesses to date, um, housing has been the number one issue. Um, transportation has not figured quite as high, but, but definitely that's something that uh, we look at as, as we think about what future um, technologies and businesses might look like. Thanks. Um, so Doug, I'm wondering if, um, you know, for now we could um, take down the screen share so sure. we can actually um, all look at each other. And then uh, Aram, if you have the questions, if you could put those up in the chat so people could see them, I think that would be helpful as well. Um, 
All right, next um, next question. And, and we, you know, this is also, you can, you can make some statements as well. I did see some statements in the chat, so feel free to add those as well to the conversation. And if you have um, responses or questions to people who have already asked a question, um, feel free to, to chime in as well and get a little discussion going. Um, okay, Trevor Goldsman is next for the question. Thank you guys, I'll turn on my camera. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you. Okay, so I uh, made a couple of notes here because resilient, I'm glad it's number one on your list. Um, uh, bottom of the list is support city services. So um, it's sort of back to front in a way I see it. Uh, resilient, yes, I agree. We need to be resilient and that is the essential. So the prices of the homes being what they, they are on your books right now is resilience because everything goes up and down as we know. So that gives us the resilience to take the hit, to take a, take another downfall, which you know this it's a slow trend we tend to go, but um, in the long run, but in the short run, the resilience here are these um, volatilities. So, um, so I just wanted to think, uh, keep that in mind, sort of, because uh, all patterns, it's all how we. So I'm looking at the big screen, and I see myself now looking here differently. Um, excuse me, but I'm looking at my notes here. Just a couple of things here. Um, Todd asked, asked the question I was also going to ask, um, and it does make sense. So this is all uh, good stuff because the more we understand, um, find out, then we can sort of support each other. Because I still feel. Um, like the last mile that you bring up, um, that's in all, in everything. Um, networking, and then we're a social network, we're essentially social organisms. So the last mile is the guys, our neighbors, the people next to us. So I'd still like you guys to keep thinking and keep the last mile, let the neighborhoods make those decisions amongst the neighbors to figure out how best to get those services in and out, how best, what the wireless networks are, all the last mile bits and pieces that connect everything. Get the community and get their input, explain to them, let them understand or gain that understanding. Um, and so anyway, that, those are my points I just wanted to make, just so to open up just a, a little, uh, and that's all. I mean, there's there's many things I will add to the conversation as we go along. But thank you for doing this. Great, thank you. Thanks, Trevor. Um, thanks for joining tonight. Okay, uh, Neil is next. Neil, I think. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, just curious on the land use um, change idea. I, I think it is intriguing. So. I have a sense that there are sacred cows uh, in the city. And when you think about uh, land use changes, I'm just curious, is there any kind of out of bounds areas? So I think about all the hills above Ventura uh, from downtown all the way to Kimball um, Avenue um, in, in terms of changing it to, you know, more multi-use um, of the space and maybe even uh, reducing the fire risk. So as we know, the fires start up in the hillsides. And so thinking creatively, how do we solve a couple problems with one stone? And how do we think about it? I know it's very touchy and very sensitive, but I, I'm just curious if there is any kind of out of bounds areas, uh, whether it's in the city area, in existing buildings or in undeveloped areas. Actually, um, Doug, maybe I'll I'll start in on that one. Um, this is this is uh, Neil. This is dangerous territory. A question oh. like that, and answer, <laughs> answering a question like that. So there are um, secret cows. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I mean, I a couple of things. So one is that um, one of the reasons that we are um, having this conversation now about economic development before we actually have the land use conversation mm -hmm. is because they're they're so tied together. And I think, you know, whether it's for housing or jobs or retail, we, we all need to understand that it's not just about, about a land use, that land use actually has implications for the fiscal sustainability of the city. And so I think, you know, that's why we're having this conversation now. And so I, I really appreciate you bringing up um, the land use. I'm going to not specifically answer your question. And I think other people on uh, on this call could uh, in this meeting could could answer the question and 
different people might view it differently. Um, you know, we have heard a lot of, um, you know, that open space should be preserved. Um, we don't want to, the city doesn't want to expand out, um, you know, keep the, the natural areas natural, um, you know, but I think if, if someone, Neil, like you has a creative idea to bring forward with this, then, then I think it's worth it to bring it forward. The general plan is the time to vision. It's the time to think big. And it's sometimes the time to question assumptions, even if what that questioning does is just reaffirm the decisions that have been made. Um, so, you know, I would encourage, really encourage people to, to think big, even if the final solution and the final answer is coming back to sort of what we think we all know. Um, so I think that's, that's trying to answer the question without actually answering the question. But, um, but <laughs> you know, I mean, I, again, I appreciate, I appreciate bringing it up because, um, you know, I think there probably are some sacred cows as you well, said. Well, yeah, and I, I, I think really there should be more of a sense of urgency around climate change too, because I think this yearly event of having the city under threat of being burned down and more homes being burned, you know, I think where there's, you know, disasters, I think there's opportunities. And I think the hillsides where the fires are most likely to start and, and cause damage and, and create havoc, maybe is the area to start thinking about, you know, how we're using that land. And, and I'm not saying concrete the whole thing, but we need to do something to, uh, you know, at least reduce that threat. And then at the same time, improve the economy by um, using the land for really great uh, opportunities as you, as you pointed out. And Neil, could I ask you, since we're, we're starting on a, a little bit of a deep dive of a conversation here, which I think is fine, we'll probably want to continue this, but you know, you say use the land for something else, not pave everything. What does that look like to you? That's a really good question. I, okay. I have to think about it a bit, but I mean, I think it's, there's a whole lot of people in this, in this meeting here that probably are way more creative than me, but, and we could sit down and have a, a separate little task force and, and kind of brainstorm what would, would that look like? And how do you get buy-in from, you know, all these good people and all the citizens of Ventura to say, yeah, that makes sense. Because frankly, I'd rather have a city to live in that is not under the threat of fire constantly and use that land for something um, better and more productive and at the same time reduce fire danger because it is it is inevitable every year gonna, it's going to get worse so we really need to do something yeah well i think i think um neil i think the, thank you for bringing up those points i think you're right this is sort of a, an idea that we put a pin in and we come back to and sort of keep this in the back of our mind about how do we how do we reduce the fire threats in the city still preserve what everyone loves about the city with the hillsides and are there ways to even do that and think about economic development at the same time? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, and sorry, everyone, that was a little bit of a deep dive. Um, so, okay, next, uh, Judy. I have a variety of different kinds of issues um, and concerns. One has to do with um, tourism, which Ventura has done well with in the past, and I'm wondering about the possibility of some kind of general attraction that can be green, that will bring people to the city. Um, we don't have a convention center. We don't have um, a place for a large gathering. We don't really have a place and that's really active. You know, our pier only holds a few people, you know, going down by the beach, you know, only holds a few people in reality. And so those are wonderful places for people to come. And one reason people come to Ventura is our ocean, but we don't really have an attraction. So I'm wondering about the possibility of some type of convention center and some type of green attraction. And maybe those two can work together. Doesn't, I don't look at it as either or. Um, the second issue has to do with housing and the need for worker housing. And one of the problems is we've all watched our housing costs go up, and I'll use mine as an example, a house that 
I purchased when I was working full time and qualified and afforded for $120,000 now sells for $750,000. So a new social worker coming in, there's no way they could afford to buy a house as you look at those kinds of things. So I'm looking at the need for professionals because they're going to spend money. And so that need for there to be housing for young new professionals, as well as for those who are on very limited incomes that we've learned we're very dependent on, and for those that need to come off the street. So that range for housing, include especially worker housing, um, as if there's a place for the whole range of economic workers to live, it makes a difference. So seniors like myself, we don't leave our property. And when you showed that graph, yeah. So my property is valued very low, whether I think Prop 13 is fair or not, when you talk about a sacred cow, um, I benefit from that. The city doesn't, the county doesn't. Um, it's hurtful actually in those ways. And the people suffering are my neighbors who are raising a young family. So does some things in terms of taxation and all that need to be addressed? But it's the larger issue is the affordability of housing for workers. And that means some places for those of us who are now on fixed incomes that could afford the houses we bought 30 years ago, can't even afford to rent a studio. So we stay where we are with lots of extra space because there's really no place for us to relocate to. And so that has a huge impact on the market. The other issue that was raised was a larger issue of density. And people scream when they hear that word. And when people think not single family dwellings, but you know, higher density, um, multifamily dwellings, which I'm in favor of and we need. And you know, the day of everything being single family for me, I understand is over. But selling that to the larger community, getting community buy-in, is there a plan of how you would even go about doing that and what zoning changes need to be made or approved for that to happen? And that's enough of me. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Great, great thoughts. Um, you know, I'm not sure there's any, um, those are thoughts and I'm not sure there's any uh, questions. I think you had some more rhetorical questions in there of things to think about. And I think we are thinking about all of those things um, in the planning process. I will I, uh, if there's anything specific you want us to respond to, um, chime in. But I, I will say that, you know, we we were intentional of having this meeting um, tonight, and then on June 15th we have a meeting on housing. Um, and so I'd encourage it's a joint general plan advisory committee and educational forum on housing. I'd encourage everyone to come because they're so in, they're so related to one another, and it is important. I saw one of the the comments in the chat about well, if we if we build housing on industrial lands, then we can't actually have jobs in this, the jobs in the city for the people who are moving in here. And you know, I think that's a great point. We have to be really careful about where we're building the housing and what that's doing to the uses that are there now and how that impacts the economy. So it's all tied together and we need to think about that together. Um, Paul Sheenan, you're next. Good evening. Um, well, first of all, uh, not to be too redundant, but I was quite pleased to see uh, the very strong acknowledgement uh, that we do need the housing and we don't just need it because rents are rising and ho housing costs are going up. Uh, we need it because of the economic impacts and to help businesses be able to expand and to move here. I mean, it's a clear problem uh, in the economy and the business community. And, you know, I just think it's important that it remain a focus point. Uh, like a number of people that are in this forum tonight, uh, I've been involved for decades in planning issues and zoning issues in this community. And uh, usually, you know, there are some good goals. And I look back at some things that had happened in the past as I asked myself, uh, even you put the question up, what about areas that need to be improved or modified to accomplish goals? Well, when we did the um, general plan update in 2005, in my personal opinion, I don't think too many will argue, it was heavy on platitudes and very weak on implementation. And it set some general goals that in many cases were at direct odds 
uh, with the existing zoning that was sitting on the property that had a new, de new designation in the general plan. And the idea was to straighten that out within uh, two years, they said. Well, as we all know, with very few exceptions, this never happened. And for a few years, there was just a general approach. Well, the, whatever the general plan says, we will take it as the priority on a project by project basis. But over the years, things started to happen that got in the way of that. Um, uh, most of you will recall not too many years ago, uh, a previous city council decided that, well, maybe they didn't like the fact that you could put multifamily housing in some of our commercial zones. And they went on a big campaign to stop that and to put a cap on it, even though it was clearly allowed in the zoning ordinance. Uh, there was a, I won't name the project, but there was a particular large site in the Seaward area that actually got some preliminary approvals for a multi-family project there. It's an old manufacturing facility. And after it got some of these preliminary approvals that a city council did a 180 degree turn and said, no, you know what? We wanna save this for industrial use and just put a knife in the heart of this thing. And I personally believe there's a lot of opportunity in what today are some commercial sites, especially those that are underused, in some industrial sites that are underused. And I would like to see a more forceful approach to this, not uh, to force people to build, but just to give, give some clear guidance and policy that people can count on. I also think we clearly need transit-oriented development. Uh, we've got a Metrolink station, we've got a train running through town, we have a lot of other things that we really could take advantage of that. And then my one question is, because I haven't seen it addressed any place, in terms of starting a process to designate some parcels that need to be redesignated so that we could do housing on them, how does in including that in the housing element update and the schedule of the housing element update interplay with the timing of the overall general plan. And with that, I'll. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, you know, I know that um, uh, we're gonna talk about the last piece um, at the housing meeting in more detail, but, but let, me, let me answer it quickly now, which is that, um, uh, and this is gonna get a little wonky for people who are not um, focused on the housing element, um, the housing element is the only element um, that is really required to be reviewed and approved and updated on a regular basis um, by the state. And it's every eight years. And we need to have a updated housing element uh, less than a year from now, um, which is not enough time for all of us. And, and COVID got in the way, but it's not enough time to, for all of us to work together to make um, big land use decisions in the city overall. And so what we're gonna do is a housing element um, that a first round of the housing element update that is based on the existing general plan. And then we're going to go back and revise the housing element based on proposed land uses that we're gonna develop as part of this process. It is not ideal, we know that. Um, but the state has been very inflexible in um, extending deadlines. And we wish that they would give us some flexibility because we got waylaid because of COVID in this whole process. Um, they have not been um, uh, nice about that. And so, well, this is the process that we have to do. So we're gonna go through it one time and then we're gonna come back again um, and make sure that, that it's in lockstep with the new general plan. Are you going to allow it all, in that first round where you say it's based on the current general plan, um, are you going to have any provisions in that uh, for changes on particular properties that might make sense to change that, own, that the owners are willing to change? Um, that is a good question. We're actually working right now on what we call the site's inventory, which is to take stock of how much land there is available for housing that meets the state's housing requirements. Um, we are, you know, the goal is to actually minimize and, and do as little land use change as possible in this first round. Um, because land use changes, you know, we know they're so critical um, and they're big decisions for the city and we don't take them lightly. 
So we're trying to avoid as many of those as, as possible in this process. But um, we'll talk about that more in two weeks. So please, um, Paul, please come to that meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, again, another, another deep dive here. Um, and I, you know, I wanna, um, Spencer, you're next as you're um, un, unmuting yourself. I wanna um, give props out to all of you. I, I love the chat in the chat room that this community has. Um, you guys do such a great job of sharing really um, constructive, positive ideas. And even if you don't agree with each other, you're, you're always so positive about it. So, you know, keep it up. I think, it, I think it's great. We don't see that in every community. Um, so, so well done. Um, okay, Spencer. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm doing a quick drive, so I'm gonna leave my camera off. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to make a comment. Um, I have the honor of serving as the current Parks and Rec Commissioner. And, all, and I'm thinking that economic vitality goes through technology, recreation, and also beautification. And it was really promising to hear about the housing. And we know the housing is coming and how we can address that in our city is gonna be very unique and dynamic. But to really be attractive in the city is what's important. And so Trade Desk, I believe has laid the way with other great companies, but the 3D printing and hearing about technology was really exciting. Um, but from the recreation side, I would like to speak briefly about how we can really be attractive for events and tourism through our recreation. We look at the event and the rumors that we had just started and hopefully still come true about possibly the X Games with ESPN coming to our town, what that possibly could do to economically to be, stimu to be stimulant, um, building relationships with marathons like Mountain to Beach. We had the Amgen bike tour come through here. Um, these are all great opportunities. And then kind of referring back to recreation to talk about a prior speaker about the hillsides and preserving the open space, the Ventura Land Trust has been doing such a great job creating that with Harmon Canyon and future acreage. How can the city find a partner with them to find out to bring more recreation and taxes uh, through the tourism? Because think of how what a great destination spot we are every day of 365 days of the year, if you can come hiking in the most beautiful hills in the world, next to the Los Padres Forest, looking down at the Pacific Ocean. And last but not least, um, it was talking about beautification and really looking at the details of our small city and looking at the signs, the streets, uh, the trash, the drains, all of our little details I think that we can look to beautify our city would really be somewhere to be attractive. And I'll look to like public art, uh, we're known and be referred to as a drive-through city. Um, how some people do that, it's beyond me, but they do drive through it, right? You go from down the Caneo grade through um, the, the plateau, Oxnard, through Ventura, up to Santa Barbara, uh, into Montecito and other great places. But public art, I believe, like around California Street, if we can possibly continue to talk about moving our exit off of California Street onto Oak Street, that would give this vibrant viability of exit in downtown Ventura. Stay in downtown Ventura, not to just get gas, but ultimately to stay for the night, to stay for a couple of days and spend a quality amount of money. I think public art and being attractive from the 101 freeway could be a great sign for us to do that. So again, uh, economic vitality through uh, technology, uh, recreation, and Thank you so much. Thank you, Spencer. Um, you you ended just as you were um, as we were losing service as you were losing service. So I think we we got everything in there. Um, I will point out that uh, part of our project, part of our consultant team's project, is actually um, public um, public art and culture. So we're actually including that as part of our work on the general plan. Um, and we have a special consultant um, who is focused just on that. So there'll be more to come on that in the future. Uh, Carl Morehouse. Thank you, Matt. Um, as somebody who's had the pleasure of serving on the council for 17 years, uh, it's really funny because a lot of these topics I've been talking about for 25 years, and uh, it really hasn't changed except for the numbers and the percentages. I know a good many sitting around here who've also seen me. Uh, I don't have jars of pennies tonight and I don't have stacks of poker chips. But I do have, do have the two DVDs that talk about that. 
Unfortunately, I can't get those to the city council to watch or the city manager because they don't use DVDs now. I've got to figure out a way to download those. Doug, I'll get you and the rest of the council members something. I, th I think the questions have been asked tonight about how our taxes are structured is a broader picture question that needs to be put back out there. And while some of the numbers and percentages have changed, it's very important. But clearly two of our economic legs in the city have been tourism and healthcare. We are the only city that has two hospitals and, and we've de developed a whole wellness district around that. So uh, I, th I thought the chart showing that we have a lot more job opportunities, but the, the people don't live here. Us ba baby boomers are gonna age out. We're gonna need a lot of healthcare workers to cover us. And so there's gotta be affordable housing for that. Um, with regards to the tourism, it was real interesting last night, Channel 3 out of Santa Barbara was talking about with everybody taking off their mask and running back out. Uh, there are a lot of small businesses that are suddenly seeing a resurgence. And while we've had this strange result of the pandemic and people doing uh, remote uh, purchasing, I think there's going to be a, a, a high demand for us to touch base with people again. And so I think that the chance for us to survive on, on commerce and particularly revitalizing our downtown as we have uh, is, is still there. The restaurant businesses and all of that. Of course, having waited tables once upon a time myself and bartended, hopefully those wages will come up and, uh, and that'll make it a worthwhile job for a lot of people. But very tied to our tourism is something I've been pushing for a long time. And this is uh, a, a drum that Doug started pounding way before I ever did, and that's capping our freeway. If we don't, don't do that major change and cap the freeway, and then also as a result of that, create a multimodal station that gives us a place for people to get off when they come here for tourism, instead of getting out in Santa Barbara at a beautiful uh, depot there, this is an opportunity that we need to capitalize on, but it's a long process. The longest journey takes uh, a single step and we need to start that way. I have one quick question of you, Matt, or, or Doug, or whoever, uh, with regards to something I heard today, I listened in on Skaggs Regional Council meeting, and there was a report out from the economic basis there. In fact, by the way, I'd urge, urge all of you to uh, watch what's coming up with Skaggs, uh, get a hold of them and their USC annual demographics report. That's a very important driving piece, and I'll try to show that out for people to share. But Skag, uh, was, there was a report out that there are major corporations buying up single family homes and turning around and renting them. I don't know if that phenomenon is creeping into Ventura yet, Paul, or any of you others who monitor that more closely. But the, that's a scary thought that uh, we're going to have find a lot of our single family homes won't be accessible to people to buy and build equity. Instead, they're going to be turned into to rental homes by these corporations. And that's something I think we need, need to monitor. So that's kind of a broad picture. And I'm always available for background history on both the city and SCAG and other regional agencies if anybody ever wants to reach out to me. Thanks, Carl. You, you are indeed a wealth of knowledge on, on this information. We appreciate it. Um, Doug, do you have an, do you know about um, single family homes being bought up or um, Peter, I don't know if you have any information on this, Peter Gilly. So it's I, a phenomenon that, that we definitely have heard about. I don't have any information about the extent to which that might be occurring in Ventura, but, but um, it's something that, that we should definitely monitor as we're going through this process. It could have some major impacts on us all the way around. And if it's starting in Southern California, it'll eventually reach here. Yeah, and we're, we're hearing about it in, in lots and lots of places. Um, and a lot of that um, really, really started in the economic downturn where people couldn't afford houses except for corporations. Um, there was a lot of foreign money coming in and buying homes. Um, and they've held on to those homes, the prices have gone up. And what it's really done is it's put home ownership, as you said, out of reach for a lot of people um, because they're also not likely to sell. Um, and so there's a lot of homes that, that are in that situation. I don't know the numbers in, in Ventura. That's something we can try looking into. Okay, thanks, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Kate Faulkner, you are next. Yeah, so actually the issue I was gonna bring up was corporate ownership. Of, of homes and because um, I was a little concerned that we're sort of what you're proposing. It seemed like um, as you reference the older housing stock tends to be lower value. And of course I'm, that seems to be largely related to Prop 13. Um, but I, I have heard about corporate ownership of single family homes. 
I would assume that these multifamily complexes are even more likely to be um, owned by um, investors. And I wonder if that is putting us on a treadmill to the same problem in the future where we'll have these multifamily units that cost much more for the city to provide services to than, than what they bring for revenue. So it seems like we need to focus on somehow um, encouraging um, ownership by individuals, not corporations, and then possibly condominiums rather than, than rentals in um, some of the multi-family uh, units. So that was, that's my concern. I, I, I guess I've never seen a city build its way out of economic problems or just more housing. I'm not, because that brings along so many other issues. And um, so I think we have to consider that very carefully. Yeah, thank, thanks, um, Kate. I think a lot of, a lot of people share, share those concerns as well um, that you have. If you're gonna build, you build in, in a way that's, that's beneficial and not just building for building's sake. Um, okay, uh, Jeff Manson. I think I got myself unmuted. Um, no, I, um, I am a uh, local resident, father, um, learning as I go along. I, I can't tell you how much I enjoy, yes, the chat feature on the side, seeing everybody um, pro uh, provide so much um, helpful input. And, um, uh, you know, as, as I sat and listened tonight, um, a couple things came out in my mind. Of course, I, I am a local construction guy, so I am here um, promoting uh, hiring local workers. Um, I, I, I know that... Um, you know, tourism comes, goes. certainly we saw that over the last year when people didn't have the opportunity to travel to our town. Um, those that live within the town continue to spend here. Um, so I think uh, local hire work clauses are extremely important and I will continue to beat that drum, but that's not the only reason I'm here. I'm here as a prospective homeowner one day. I am here as um, a parent raising children. Um, a couple of things I was thinking about tonight is um, I have, I have school age kids now and I heard um, that we need to uh, provide uh, jobs for people after they come back from college. And um, I, I heard that mentioned somewhere and I wanted to point out that um, an organization that I work for offers um, local non-college training uh, in the construction trades. Um, we, we work with high schools and um, not everybody needs to go away to school. Not everybody needs to spend $200,000 in student loans um, to get an education. There's a lot of good quality jobs um, uh, and opportunities um, where people don't have to put themselves into such financial debt. Um, uh, we, have a, we have a wonderful program um, called Hard Hats, uh, Helmets to Hard Hats. And uh, what this does is it helps um, to transition veterans returning and get them into construction trades. Um, and so there's wonderful opportunities locally for people to um, transition into a workforce here and work here and live here. Um, and I just wanted to promote a few of those in case people hadn't heard of those yet. I was interested in the that I saw the 22.6% you know, of, of the general fund is a uh, local uh, sales tax and that kind of stuff. And that once again goes toward, you know, we want people that are getting paid to work in Ventura to spend their money in Ventura. We want them to go out to dinner in Ventura. We want them to pay their um, taxes in Ventura. Um, all these things are important. Um, I love I love that you know I get to sit here and I get a I get to learn and I get to um, actually see things going on about the building of Ventura. This is something that I haven't been involved in before, and um, I, I just wanted to speak up, let people see my face, let people know that there is a younger generation that is active, wants to be active, and wants to learn and help Ventura grow. So I don't know if there were a lot of questions in there, but um, I love being able to be part of this and I'm just grateful for everyone being here tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for coming out to these meetings. I, I have certainly seen your, your face and heard your voice before. Um, so we appreciate you coming out. Um, Todd, you are next. And then um, I, we, have, we have time for a lot more questions and comments. So um, feel free to raise your hand, everyone. Um, I was wondering if uh, Doug had done, been able to do an analysis of the rate of turnover of the older, uh, lower valued homes because of Prop 13 into market rate homes. 
Uh, I am one of those owners, as was Judy Alexander, probably others here too. And I want to, again, demographically speaking, you know, we only have so much life left here and there might be a way of projecting when those market rate homes come back on the market, which is part of the revenue stream for the city. I've always looked at kind of, if revenue is butterflies, the city, city only has a couple of butterfly nets and you can talk about this kind of jobs and that kind of jobs and executive housing, and everything else. The city doesn't collect any of that money except through property taxes, which again has to precipitate, be precipitated by sales, which the city can't uh, kind of precipitate itself. It's a volunteer effort on the part of the owners or by sales taxes. We really don't have ways of gathering money and we have to remember that. Uh, and much of the city's operations, the, the aesthetic cleanup, the arts, things like that are part of that general fund that relies on sales tax and property taxes. So I hope people will keep that in mind is that there's, there's a big disconnect between the city's fiscal soundness and talk about business opportunity. Certainly business opportunity is important between businesses and for jobs because that keeps the resilience, which I think is a good um, objective in the city's general plan and the economic element particularly. But onto sacred cows, which were mentioned a couple of times, like Neil mentioned, what about the hillsides? Um, SOAR is a, is a virtual ordinance that requires a public vote to change that land use status up there. So it's not gonna convert easily. And while it's a sacred cow, it's, it's wrapped around with um, a lot of legal impediments to changing it. And I still think, I'm, I'm not clear in my own mind, how putting development up there, making investments in the path of future fires is necessarily a good strategy. Other sacred cows, I believe, is the um, San Buenaventura State Beach Park, which has the potential of being a place for many tourists to land with temporary overnight stays as a sort of an RV park, as many state parks allow for. But traditionally, that's been frowned upon by people on Vista del Mar because they don't want to see RVs down that massive parking lot. But the, the state is actually going through a general plan process right now. So there ought to be some coordination between the city and the state regarding the use of that property, and particularly as a potential tourist destination where, again, revenues could be collected, tourist revenues, purchases of food, drink, gasoline, things like that. Um, another sacred cow, I believe, is probably our golf courses. Hopefully nobody's a golfer here and swing a club at me, but uh, we talked about needing land for new industrial uses for manufacturing, but the city may be one of the longest, largest landowners in terms of its golf courses. Uh, and the question I would raise is from a financial standpoint, would it be better for the city to hang on to the ownership of that and have a revenue stream from leasing that property to people who wanna develop it for manufacturing or whatever else uh, seems to be needed here for lack of other available land. Stanford University finances a whole bunch of its infrastructure and systems out there because they got a huge shopping center that they own and people pay rent and lease money back to them. So um, I think that may be again a sacred cow, certainly for golfers, but there's also the idea of should the city even be a landlord? And I think that's worth questioning in terms of things should the city is solvent in the long term. Thank you. Todd, Todd, those are those are great points, and I, um, you know, I appreciate you bringing up some of some of these um, sacred cows. I think maybe we could come up with with another name for these um, areas besides besides sacred cows. But um, you know, I think it is important to think about what they are, and then you know, again, as part of this process, I think it's it's very worthwhile for us to collectively ask ourselves whether they are truly in the untouchable category and under what conditions. Could they be touched? Whatever, whatever they are. Again, this is the, this is a time to do that, um, and I'm not saying we should, but I think we should ask that. We should ask the questions. Uh, Doug, do you want to um, take a minute and talk about what are the potential sources of revenues or the better sources of revenues? Because um, you know, I think Todd hit the nail on the head with this, but um, I don't know if there's anything you want to respond to in terms of the sources of revenues. Well, um, the thing that struck me is, as you were talking is, um, and we have talked about this, uh, to the extent that we can provide a more diverse housing stock and, and more different 
types of housing. It gives the opportunity for older residents to have an attractive, affordable alternative to, you know, their single family home that maybe is they it's too big for what they really need, but you know, there aren't good alternatives. So so having that diversity of housing stock not only supports the younger workforce uh, in terms of, you know, people coming into the city, but I, I think could possibly also help the long-term existing residents. And then that turnover, uh, as you said, Todd, the, the, the turnover in property has a big impact on, on city revenues because going from, you know, 350,000 assessed value up to 750,000 if a sale is made has a big impact on the revenues that the city sees. And so to the extent there are opportunities to stimulate um, not only turnover, but new investment. Uh, so a lot of the things we've talked about tonight, um, people have mentioned the fact that there are older commercial areas that you know, are probably obsolete uh, and could be opportunities for more intense development that would still provide maybe some retail and service opportunities, but mixed use and, and some higher um, density of residential to go along with it. So creating that intensity of development on some of these older sites would also be a way to um, increase assessed values, create new opportunities. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that helps the city a lot is, is new investment um, and, and, and creating incentives for new investment by property owners, by business owners you know, by, by folks that are here. Um, so I think that the land use process does have a big impact on the city's fiscal health. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to focus on it um, as much as we did in tonight's meeting. And it will be a, you know, a running theme throughout the general plan update. I, th I yeah. think you've, you've outlined this ongoing conundrum. We, we talk about, we can raise property values which is good because it brings more property taxes in, which helps the city fiscally, but by the same token, it makes housing less affordable for people who live here or people who need to fill these vacant jobs that are out there that can't afford to live here. So we, we can't have it both ways. And one way I suppose of making houses more affordable in a sense is having two income residents in that home, typically a husband and wife, but if they have kids and suddenly there's often, in the case we've learned through COVID, the women drop out of the workforce because of childcare issues, and suddenly they can't afford that $700,000 home if they could do it to, to begin with. So I think childcare may be, a, again, a way, sort of an exit out of some of this roundabout chain of events, which creates just infeasible solutions. But if we can provide some childcare, that might allow adults, two adults, to pay for the housing that we can't seem to control the costs of and uh, allow things to at least accommodate a few more young people here. Thank you. Yep. Thank, thanks, Todd. Um, you know, we, we've sort of been skirting around a few things. Um, you know, Michelle, you're next for questions, um, but maybe we can spend um, a minute uh, or a few minutes after and, and think about some of the, the questions that we had um, that we put up and I'll just read them again, which is, um, what long-term economic goals should the city pursue in the general plan? Um, and yeah, we're going to continue to have conversations about this, but we'd love some feedback tonight. Um, what land use changes, if any, would help improve the city's economic outlook? And I think we've talked about some of those with, with housing and, um, and uh, uh, other uses. And then what retail and non-residential areas need improvement or could be modified to enhance economic development? Um, and I, you know, I think we're, uh, I've, I've seen some in the chat already about some areas, but I think if we can get some feedback on that, that would be, um, that would be really helpful. Um, okay, um, Michelle. Oops. I can hear you. Oh, oh, great. Um, I don't think I can figure out how to get my camera on because of my privacy settings, apparently. That's okay. But, <laughs> but we can um, hear you. that is all that's needed. So, uh, well, thank you for um, taking my questions. And this, uh, I have a question and a comment. And I've been living in Ventura for about 20 years now. And, you know, got to uh, watch how the Midtown uh, revival 
um, monies that were allocated got taken away. And, you know, definitely I would say that Midtown is one of those dead zones. But um, one of the things I have, um, and it's also great to hear all these awesome ideas, um, a lot of really great conversations and smart folks on the phone here. Um, one of the things that was brought up was implementation especially from the ideas that were discussed in the last general plan. And I've been working up in Carpinteria for 25 years. So I've been watching that city evolve and watching them bring in cups, um, you know, tech companies like Procore, LinkedIn, um, also uh, manufacturing. I still there, I actually work at a manufacturing plant myself and there's some biotech uh, manufacturing there. And um, so it kind of, Watching that town absolutely blossom, and obviously the housing prices also went up. So a lot of folks that work in Carpinteria obviously live in Oxnard or Ventura. And so my questions are, and then also just, and then and then of course Oxnard, they have the collective, and they have had um, um, Amazon's coming in there. So as this general plan evolves, how how is it going to get implemented? And in other words, you know, obviously there's a lot of great ideas. You're still looking for feedback. How would we basically, um, as citizens, understand how we can we, um, less, you know, the word new investment came up and the revenue streams, because that's obviously where this, this whole conversation is about. So what would we be looking for like propositions that would be passed or how does the process unfold once the plan gets generated and from there i will put my phone on mute thanks michelle um great great question implementation has come up um multiple times tonight um partially because the um you know we have heard tonight and we've heard previously that the existing general plan doesn't provide enough direction and specificity in terms of how the vision gets implemented or even actually what the vision is. Um, you know, there's no um, clear answer for that. There are ways that it can be implemented. Um, it, it is a very long conversation about how that can happen, but um, it, it, Michelle, it is absolutely on our radar. And um, the plan, um, our, our plan for the general plan is to have um, much more specific implementation actions and then to set up a process of ongoing monitoring and a process to evaluate um, and, and to update the implementation actions um, over time, because we don't want to think about implementation just every 15 or 20 years when the general plan is adopted. You really need to be thinking about implementation of the general plan regularly and looking at it every year or two years, tie it to the CIP and tie it to departmental budgets and decisions. Um, so at a high level, that's the direction that we're going to take with this. But uh, I think we're all on the same page that it's important. Um, Brian. Again, yeah, you can, you, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. Oh, well, uh, wearing a couple of hats tonight. First, um, as general manager of the Ventura Port District, um, to your questions that you had uh, with respect to long-term economic goals um, the city should pursue, um, obviously, from our perspective, supporting having the city support a vibrant commercial and recreational mixed use harbor uh, moving forward into the future is very important uh, to us. Uh, we do have a, a couple of undeveloped parcels, very little land left, but want to work closely with the city on that to your question about land use, land use changes. Um, I know part of the general plan update is also looking at the local coastal program. So I think there's an opportunity to, to work together um, on that. And um, with respect to my um, other role as the Chamber's um, Economic Development and Legislative Affairs Committee Chair, uh, we did have a chance to hear a presentation on the economic development element uh, last week, which was a great opportunity. Um, I think in terms of uh, the questions, again, one of the strong things that we would look for uh, from the Chamber's perspective is, of, of course, supporting a business formation uh, and investment opportunities within the city. Um, in terms of land use changes, uh, looking for mixed use opportunities for workforce housing, um, as well as opportunities for executive housing within uh, within the city. And in terms of locations, um, which which I think you allude to in, in number three, a couple of the key things that were brought up um, in our committee meeting was looking at both the west side uh, of the city um, avenue and around uh, that area. 
uh, for opportunities for um, uh, more master planning and opportunities for workforce housing. And then also um, in the Sadakoy area as well, that those were both areas of opportunity uh, for uh, infill housing. And again, to provide that housing need uh, that, the, uh, that the city has to support um, the, the business uh, activity that uh, can come to the city uh, or grow in the city that's already here. So thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, appreciate you directly answering those questions. Uh, Tracy, you're up. Thank you. Um, I am wondering, um, I know that economic development traditionally focuses on employers and employees and businesses, but if we might take an opportunity with this uh, great energy and invention and engagement that the general plan has brought, to uh, rethink self-employment, self-employment and gig workers and what, how uh, general plan purview, you know, kind of interacts with those needs. And when I talk about self-employment or say self-employment, I mean, not just um, uh, gig workers working on a computer in their home, but artists and cultural workers, as well as the mom and pop businesses that, you know, totally support families without having a business plan or even a business checking account as, COVID has taught us, those of us who've been involved in the COVID relief. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's gonna be any kind of breakaway, um, an opportunity to have a task force in this process, look uh, with invention um, at self-employment in the city and things like live work housing and permitting and um, incentivizing people to come out of the gray economy um, uh, things like that, if there's an opportunity within this process to um, get ahead of the curve, because it's not like other, place, other places are doing this, um, like economic gardening, you know, how you grow small businesses and things, but um, uh, tiny businesses. Um, but I just would encourage us maybe to have some, uh, a task force specifically on self-employment and gig working to, um, to get some ideas. It's a point well taken in, in the work that we've been doing so far. And again, we've just really started in a lot of ways in this process, but we've really trying to focus on the workforce and the, the people who live in the city that, that work. And so that clearly includes, you know, self-employed people that, you know, have their own businesses as well as the small business owners. So um, it is sort of top of mind as we go through this process and, and there'll be a number of other opportunities uh, to, to provide input and, for, and as we begin to develop strategies and implementation, you mentioned economic gardening, that's a, a very uh, popular and often effective uh, implementation strategy that you know, we can build into the program. So there, there will be opportunities to kind of refine those strategies as we go along, um, but I appreciate you raising the issue tonight to, to get it out front there. Yeah, and uh, it, Tracy, um, you know, D Doug and I worked on a project a long a while ago where it kind of shifted how you think about economic development, where it's not just about businesses, it's actually about the people. Um, and the people are the economy, in a sense. Um, and so if we think about the residents of the city as, as the economy, um, it, it can change the focus a little bit. And so I think that's a really good idea. I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, you know, we can probably talk in more detail about the other project we worked on, but, but it was sort of a fundamental shift to think about economic development. And just as a quick to riff on that, a lot of workforce development focuses, focuses on business needs and often pays for the training of workers for the businesses, but leaves the workers kind of out of the equation ultimately. So I, that's great to hear that there's some experience in that. Thank you. Yeah, and I think if we shift to think a little bit more about the workers, and the employees and the residents and what they need to, and the types of jobs they need that will actually help on, on many fronts. Great, so thank great, you. Great idea, thanks, thanks Tracy. Um, Elizabeth. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. I'm on my Bluetooth, I'm just making sure. Um, thank you for putting this together and bringing us all together and giving us this valuable information. Um, I just wanted to make, make a couple kind of like comments rather, um, I guess to the housing comment on the west side, I feel like there is a lot of potential over here. Although I will point out that it is already one of the highest 
density areas in Ventura already. Um, another thing that I wanted to uh, point out is that for manufacturing, especially, there is, I think, a lot of potential. Uh, there's already a lot of commercial buildings over by market, telephone in those areas. And recently I was through there and there seems to be a lot of areas that are for lease and open. And my concern is that we build more areas and then there's not the companies to fill it. So I think maybe a focus could be on getting, yes, definitely attract businesses and we definitely want that coming in, uh, but maybe consider putting them in the places that we already have built instead of using those resources on new places. Thank you. I'm on mute. I should uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for the comments. Uh, let's see, Lori. Oh, top of the evening, everybody. Nice to see you all. Thanks for more good dialogue and ideas. And um, I'm with the Westside Community Council for the past decade. And over the past decade, we've created a Westside vision that we brought forward in 2014 and we've revamped it over the last several years. And it's been the work of um, dozens and dozens, probably hundreds and hundreds of community members that we've reached out to across segments of our community, across you know, Spanish speaking, English speaking, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and as this general plan moves forward, um, with rapid dialogue and, and points um, and different points and ideas, I'm wondering how to make sure those ideas from the neighborhood get implemented because, um, you know, and not get lost in the process. Um, at this stage in the game, I'm grappling with that question and looking for some feedback because I feel uh, some responsibility and accountability to all the people who have spent hours putting energy into a vision for the future of the West Side in all these areas. Yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, Lori. Um, you know, you're you're pointing to part of our next phase of our work, which is um, to go out to the different community councils um, and into the neighborhoods and ask some of these questions about vision. Um, we do know that the West Side um, and I believe Midtown and other areas have actually created their own visions. Um, we are looking at those in addition to the sort of the broader conversations. Um, so the time, it, you know, it's, a, it's a, a process of both looking at the neighborhoods and looking at the city and seeing how all the, the pieces of the puzzle um, fit together. And, um, you know, I, I was, um, you know, I saw that there were, you know, heard that there were some comments about, you know, areas where housing should go. And, you know, that, that should be both a, you know, a local decision, but also a citywide decision. Mm -hmm. um, that we need to think about. And, you know, we do know housing, people have said a lot of times, put housing on the west side. Well, there's other areas of the city where, where it could go. And I know a lot of housing has gone to the west side in the past. Um, so I think those are some of that, that kind of combination of needing to look at, at scales of, um, of neighborhood as well as citywide and balance those two out. So we are going to be coming out, um, Lori, we've been coordinating with the west side council on, on the time to come to your group and we're coordinating with other <coughs> organizations as well. Thanks, I appreciate that, Matt. And it's, you know, both hearing from us um, and also, you know, from what's in the vision and what's also beyond the vision. And it's also where the rubber hits the road at the um, GPAC and the city tables. Um, so we're going to continue to look to you and need direction from you and the city leadership on how to make sure that the hard work we've done um, moves forward into this plan and into what the future of the West Side looks like. Yeah, no, un un understood. And, and um, we appreciate all the work that, that is done by the community councils <clears throat> and others in the community. Um, again, having you know, 70 folks tonight on this, I think is really a testament to the interest that you all have. Um, so as, as I was uh, listening to you and responding, a whole bunch more hands came up. Um, so again, um, you know, looking for ideas um, in response to some of the questions. Uh, Tom, you have not had a chance to speak yet, so go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm hoping this microphone is working. Uh, okay, I did put some comments in there, and I'm sorry I missed, missed the beginning, but I understand the focus, the economic de development of Ventura. I think I think that we understanding. But I want to talk about uh, I want to talk about the uh, 
just an open concern that I have, and that is uh, the development, development, of, the development of cities or the uh, the planning, planning and whatnot. Uh, um, you know, there's city city attorneys. There's there's the groups and the thing that the the different cities belong to, and then then their state state mates. And I sometimes wonder, like, okay, like, okay, just take the example of gas and oil. Okay, okay. that's pretty much out, out of California right now. Now th- those those good jobs at one point, and uh, you know, I I I'm just wondering, like, like um, if we kind of lose control and we're and we're you know, if cities are following along and just you know, every, you know, every city in California has to abide um, by the the, old, the 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 direction the whole state is going, right? And these, and, and then the city attorneys, attorneys are who's like, like, are there agendas? Or is, is there, are there, are there agendas? Are the, are the attorneys and us and everything working for the city? city? How, how does all this work? Uh, um, that's a pretty broad question. That's not exactly the, um, the, the topic of conversation tonight, which is state versus local and the, the control and the role of, um, of the cities and how they try and influence what happens at the state. Um, so unfortunately, I think we can't really answer that question in, in, in specifics. Um, maybe you could, um, we could have city staff follow up with you and have a more specific conversation uh, about that. Um, you know, the, right now the state does provide regulations and the city needs to implement those regulations. Um, well, housing, how climate change, others as well. Okay, okay, okay. Sure. Those are the things that I, I think that maybe it would be, would be worth, you know, if we, if the state, if the state, the state mandates, if there was some um, way to ver- vert some of those, like like when it when it comes to uh, parking, for instance, um, the planning. I'm just going to bring up because it's a topic I bring I bring bring up a lot. And the does the design review commit committee doesn't have any have any view over it. The uh, planning commission does not, not. And if it's not if this is not put on, we're talking about increased housing without parking. parking that it just just a, that that seems to, seems to be not really covered anywhere. I think it really does needs need to be covered. And put into the general plan plan that there should be sufficient parking. Uh, yeah. So Tom, I'm having a, you're having a there's a big echo coming off of the line for you. Maybe it's just me. I'm not sure others, but um, but yeah, you know, parking is something that the general plan um, you know, can cover related to housing as well. Um, I'm not sure I I fully heard your question, so I apologize. Well, for instance, right now the uh, the plan specifies, I think, for residential, and I'm sorry about the echo. I need to replace this microphone. Um, somewhere more around, around one, for, for every 1,500 square feet, feet of residential, one parking space allocated in a development. And that's that's very, very inadequate, extremely inadequate. So the, the um, and I'll just say, then we should maybe move on, um, but the, the, the zoning code deals with parking standards. Um, the general plan deals with it at a high level, but the zoning code deals with it at a, a more specific level, which is an implementation of the general plan. Um, and maybe, um, maybe Tom, I think since this is a something more specific and not necessarily as much related to economic development, if you want to, um, if you want to message me in the uh, in the chat, and we can try and hone in a little bit more on that um, offline. That, that would be you. great. Yeah, thank you, um, Kate Faulkner. Okay. Um, so I think the, we've had several votes on store and it was, you know, very popular. And I, I think we can assume that this, uh, quote, sacred cow is probably going to continue and that Ventura will have to live within our um, current um, urban limits. And so that means that how we use land is really important. And I think one of the things we really have to look at is the amount of space that we currently um, allocate to automobiles. And uh, so there is a move to reduce the amount, like for instance, minimum parking requirements um, that's coming down from the state. I think um, if you look at our downtown, for instance, just from looking at aerial photos, it looks to me like perhaps about 50% of the space downtown is being used by automobiles. And I think the, um, as was mentioned earlier, the economy is people. And um, if we keep that in mind, that the economy is people, not automobiles. So how do we get more density? Like downtown, for instance, I, the downtown was forced because of COVID 
into removing the cars from Main Street. And I think it's been a huge success. The, and the merchants thought they could not survive without the cars, but actually they have. And it seems to me that downtown has flourished as a community center the way it, I have never seen in the 30 years that I've been here. And if we're going to have big um, companies bring a number of employees into downtown, like what's being um, proposed by the trade desk, you cannot have each of those individuals coming with a single occupancy vehicle. So, uh, and if we want other parts of the city of Ventura to be vibrant, like um, Midtown, for instance, I think we need to follow that same type of thinking of how do we get more people um, into these areas because people are what goes into the businesses and into the restaurants and spends money. So we really need to start thinking about transit, about making um, our city more walkable and, um, and moving people into the city. Um, perhaps it's um, parking lots at the, um, at the limits where then they transfer into some other type of mechanism for coming into the city. Either they bike, they walk, they get on a bus from a node. So I think transit will be criti critical to us being able to expand um, economic vitality. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, the, um, there is a lot of land dedicated to cars, um, indeed. It just ends up sitting there, sitting there vacant. Uh, Leslie. There we go. Hi, um, I, I just wanted to put in a couple words about our creative community and, um, you know, folding that in because it is an economic factor and brings in a lot of people too. Um, and there are a lot of working artists here in Ventura and they're very important. I know you said that there was some component that you were going to address at some point to do with the art, but I'd just like to reiterate that. And um, also, you know, we have the museum, the county museum, and a little archaeology museum. And I just think there's ways that we could make that a little bit more of an emphasis and also bring in some of our history in terms of starting with the um, too much who were here, you know, and lived here. And there's a little bit of that information at the museums. And but I just think maybe we could uh, help fold that into more of a sense of the, the city and have, I think at one point they had sort of historic cultural walking tours, you know, that would go around to different areas downtown and, um, help enlighten us and educate us a little bit. So, and, and our arts are really important performing arts. We've got, you know, the theaters, the music, but it's all been a little under wraps and needs to come out more. So I, I would appreciate any kind of discussion on that too. Uh, Leslie, yes, um, great points. It is something we're talking about um, very soon. Actually, we're in, we're in final review of some of our existing conditions reports. Um, our uh, our arts and culture um, consultant, uh, cultural planning group, um, has in their report a whole discussion about the economic vitality and the the economic development benefits of arts and culture in the community. So I think you'll be you'll be interested to see that when it comes out very soon, because yes, it is it is an important part of economic development. Thank you. Um, Daniel, next. Yeah, hi, thank you. I just had one comment and it was really in regards to, to cars, but maybe in a, in a, in a slightly different way. Um, I just wanted to, to see what your guys' thoughts were or if you reached out to the automobile um, dealerships and see what their long-term agenda is because I don't think the 21st century model of selling cars is going to be fleets in lot. And there's a lot of potential in unused or used land there. And so I don't know if somebody's reached out to the dealerships in general in our city and county 
or state, but I know there, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, in unkind of used um, area that's basically being land banked. So I don't know what you guys have done or have looked at, but I'd be interested to hear. Daniel, Daniel, good question. Uh, Doug, do you want to? Yeah, it's de definitely on our agenda. We haven't talked yet to the dealers in Ventura, but um, I've done a lot of work on that topic for other communities where auto sales is a is a big part of their sales tax. And definitely there are changes coming and underway in terms of how people are going to own cars in the future, um, car sharing, and of course, all the uh, ride sharing and, and um, autonomous vehicles and so forth. So there are a lot of changes underway and the industry is working through that and laying plans on, on how to address it. And it's certainly gonna be a big factor going forward. So it's definitely on our radar and I appreciate you raising that issue. Yeah, and I'm just, just to very quickly um, add to that, Doug, um, you know, it is, on, it is on the radar, I think, you know, uh, companies like like Tesla and some of the new emerging companies, we're seeing a lot more car companies coming out now. And I think we are gonna have a new model um, of auto sales in the future. Um, I think um, if you actually ask the dealers, because I have done this again in other projects, they just implement what the companies tell them to implement in terms of size, signage, everything. So um, I will tell you, I don't think we're actually going to get a lot of information out of the dealers themselves. I think we have to look bro more broadly than that um, and try and predict a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, Trevor, we have, um, we have about a little over five minutes left. Well, I won't take it all up. Thank you. Yeah, and yeah, Daniel, please, please don't. Other people are going to want to talk. I hope so. Um, yes. No, I just wanted to bring up because I had a little note here um, about the, I, I, and I wasn't sure about the, the new trends or nagging trends or something to that effect. Um, but really, the point was to get back to what Jeff had brought up with the carpenters, with the hard hats and what have you. Um, and what I'm passionate about is, uh, you know, it, and because we're talking about economy and we all live in the same house and, you know, I'm not very good at cleaning my mess, as Daniel may know, I think he could, it alluded to buff and shine at one point. I think it may be you, Daniel, and it gave me a good laugh because uh, anyway, I'll, if anybody wants to know, that's not quite an inside joke because it's public information it's on one of the um, business admin uh, meetings. Um, but anyway, the point being volunteers, once again, um, we're all kids. We need, you know, we go to school, Ventura Unified School District takes the kids and does it. But us bigger kids who do, um, are not eligible to go and have got, you've gone 20 years to school or more, um, have that opportunity to sort of come back to school and learn to clean our rooms again and clean the house up and pick up after ourselves and do all of this stuff. So um, like Jeff with the hard hats, the young guys showing the, the other kids how to get in. Um, you know, I've lived in a bunch of places around the world. So I'm diverging and jumping in tangents over here, but it's all the same thing. It's we work together, we show each other how to do it. Um, in Durban in South Africa as a kid, you know, along the beachfront, very similar to our promenade along the beachfront. There's a couple of miles of open promenade and beaches and what have you. Even though it was segregated at the time, there were still beaches for everybody. And they had rickshaws, big giant carriages that the guys would run. The Zulu guys would just love it. They would run and we all loved it. So they would get on there. Those type of things, personal, you know, we're speaking about active transportation, but incorporate those type of things like Kate had mentioned, but Bring, let them park the cars outside, the single users, even the families. Come in, we've got transport inside the town and we will take you, the kids on their bikes with the carriages, with the rickshaws and those type of things. So I'm, I'm asking you to think in those terms, find a way to incorporate, um, and I'll work once again with you guys, to get the volunteers, to find the, fit the spots, find who's got the skills, where and what have you. But from the city's point of view, use this in the budgeting, look at the volunteer and say, look, these guys can fill in $25 million worth of our budget right here. We've got these resources if we can show it to you. So think about, look at it in those type of terms going forward. Where can we use the wasted resources? Like I said the other day, the, the holes in our pockets where we don't realize we're neglecting things. And one of the things I'm passionate about is efficiencies, but let it be, 
if you don't know how to do it because otherwise spinning our wheels is spinning our wheels and we're hurting everything so let it let's settle find a, a good way to work together uh, you know scrum together carry each other keep moving but keep incorporating everybody every community member every the least of us has a place so and we need to um keep this sort of this type of thing going and that's all i want to say at this point thank, thank you very thanks, much Drew. trevor and then i think our last um comment is uh, going to be from todd the last word oh do we have others um hold on one thank second you, todd. Uh, hold on one up, second todd um maria did you um i saw you raise your hand is there any comments from the spanish speaking room no nothing okay uh, there's been a lot of you know discussion about how the city should do this or do that in terms of changing land uses, but I think the city has in the past and could in the future function as some of it a midwife in terms of moving businesses from place to place or helping to maximize uses. The school, Unified School District, had its bus yard in downtown Ventura taking up very valuable space, which is now being converted to condos, um, and moved it up the avenue to a place where I believe it was formerly used by oil firm. Similarly, the Daniel brought up about the uh, auto dealers. If the auto dealers knew, for example, that the city would allow for the tall towers that I think Carvana has where the cars are stored in a large tall tower, you can see it down on the five freeway in Orange County, for example, they then would say, okay, we've got this extra space that's been sitting with one car per whatever square feet. We can now convert this to some alternative use, but doing so, knowing that the city is working with them to perhaps change the zoning or some regulations to allow for modified uh, automobile marketing. Another opportunity I think could be a win-win in several ways is on the Venture Avenue. There's now a very contentious proposal from the uh, Southern California Gas Company to increase the capacity and size of their gas compression plant there on North Olive Street. It's a big, big property and yet it's not, it's next to a school, it's in the middle of a residential area. I drove by the other day, I could smell the, the gas fumes. It's not a good place for that. Um, we got oil fields, we got gas compression plants up in the oil fields off the avenue, but in the hills away from residential areas. Again, if the city could act in some sort of midwife function, perhaps with the county who controls those areas, say, well, let's get the gas plant out of harm's way, we'll get people out of harm's way by moving the gas plant up off the residential area and into the hillsides, that would free up more land. Similarly, we've got a large post office operation in downtown, sits in prime area, and much of that property is devoted to postal trucks. That could be shifted to some other location and free up a space for maybe a higher and better use with more um, sales tax revenue, maybe property taxes as well. So I think city could look at its role as a midwife Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Todd. Um, I have never actually, this is the first time I have ever heard someone refer to a city as a role of life in my 25 years of doing this. So, so thank you for that, for that as a closing thought this evening. Um, so we are, um, we're uh, pretty much out of time uh, tonight. We, this was really an introduction to the topic and, and opportunity to answer questions. Um, I have seen a lot of comments I haven't been able to read, but I've seen a lot of comments um, in the chat um, responding actually to some of the questions we had. So we'll be, um, we'll be saving those. Um, we have, I um, just want to bring up just a few of our uh, upcoming meetings. Um, the next, as I had mentioned a couple of times, is the um, Joint General Plan Advisory Committee meeting and educational forum on June 15th, um, and that's going to be on housing. Um, we then have uh, a meeting with just the General Plan Advisory Committee on June 29th, which is also on housing. Um, we're gonna be continuing to work through these, these comments and these ideas. We are probably gonna um, put out some, some mini surveys, maybe to try and get more information and more responses to some of the questions that we have here this evening. Um, I'd also encourage all of you, if you're not on our email database, to go ahead and sign up to be on the database through the website and to check in regularly for, um, for updates. We will be sending regular updates to, um, to all of you and to the database. 
Um, so please do that. Um, and then through the website, there's an ability to provide um, comments through the email system. If you have additional ideas, if you have additional thoughts on how we could work together on some of these topics, um, please share them with us and we will do our best in order to, um, to respond to that. Um, that is all that we have this evening. Doug, do you have any closing comments before we go? No, I just appreciate all the ideas and input. It's been very valuable for, for us and I look forward to continuing this conversation as we go through the process. Yeah, that's, that's great. And um, you know, I, as, I'm, as I'm sitting here, there's, there's a huge number of comments that are continuing to come in. Um, so if we, um, we'll leave this open actually for a couple of minutes, if you all wanna keep writing comments, um, we're going to um, sign off Arm um, on my team. You can wave Arm. Arm will stay on if you guys want to keep writing comments. Um, that, is, that is great. We will take everything that we can get. Um, thank you all for joining this evening. Again, your comments are, and questions are great and so in-depth, and we really appreciate the feedback that we're getting from all of you and the partnership we have with all of you. Um, so with that, we'll sign off, um, and we'll see probably many of you on the 15th. Good night, everybody.